Hello, I'm Ross from Britain's Hidden History. Welcome back for another instalment from Wirt Sykes' is most excellent book, which is Rambles and Studies of South Wales. It's so unusual to see Wales, South Wales, particularly in a positive light, especially during that period, where, as he says himself during the book, um, nothing about it seems to have been written. So without further ado, I'm going to be running some rather nice video of Land of Cathedral in the background. It doesn't tie the story, so it's just sort of visual interest, if you like. So I hope you enjoy that. And let's see if I can work out the technology. And here we go. Let's turn that volume down. Yep. In a suburb of Cardiff, a few minutes' walk from the centre of town, through streets whose lines of residences is almost unbroken, is the city of Llandaff. The name signifies merely the church, Llan, upon the Taff. And though the palace has been the city since remote antiquity, it is now a pitiful little cluster of houses, holding perhaps 600 inhabitants. Some say the first Christian fane in Great Britain was here. Yes, 179 AD would be the original founding. See some of those old walls on the video there. And it was certainly the seat of the earliest Christian bishopric. No fuss is made, but this could be the oldest, not the building that's there now, it's fallen down a couple of times, but the site... And this area is the oldest Christian cathedral site in the world. Not that you'd know if you went there or read the tourist guides. But he was aware of it back in 1881. Uh, it's misleading the founders because they're the official ones on the wall uh, inside, which is later. 450s, I think. Its founders... Anyway, back to the book. Sorry for interrupting. Its founders were Saints Dubricius and Tylo. But there are no remains of their edifice, the thing they built, now standing. Bishop Urban rebuilt the cathedral during his reign over the sea, and part of his work still stands in its original beauty. In the century after Urban, i.e. the 13th, still more of the existing edifice was built, and Jasper Tudor erected the North West Tower. After the Reformation, the cathedral fell upon evil days, the sea was utterly impoverished after having been one of the wealthiest churches in Christendom, and a bishop caused himself to be announced at court as the Bishop of Aff, quaintly remarking that the land had been taken away. So said land Aff, just Aff. I love that. The building soon fell into ruin, and sad was its state for many a long year afterwards. During the early part of last century, it was at its worst, a roofless ruin with grass growing in its long hair, long drawn aisles, and bats and owls flitting through the hollow sockets of its sightless windows, all overgrown with ivy. All are now dead who saw this sorry sight, but their descendants relate the tale. Strange things the neighbours say have happened here. Wild shrieks have issued from the hollow tomb. Dead men have come again and walked about, and a great bell has told unrung, untouched. The first object to attract your attention when you drive into Land of City is an ancient cross, which we just saw actually, which has been standing from time immemorial. Near it is the ruin of the castellated gateway to an episcopal palace which is destroyed. All but these few stones by Owen Glyndewer. It's slightly loud, isn't it? Judging from what remains, this palace must have been a tremendous structure, more fitted to have been the stronghold of some fierce Norman robber, anything but church-going in his habits, than the home of a peaceful prelate. The ruined gatehouse looks from the outside an exceedingly shaky and dangerous pile. Oh, sorry, I interrupt the, the, the three-faced item you see there. They're very significant on other videos. Sorry. <laughs> the ruined gatehouse looks from the outside an exceedingly shaky and dangerous pile, but is in fact so solid, with its huge walls six feet thick, upon whose ragged tops the earth of accumulated ages lies deep, the rank grass and wild overgrowth of centuries springing from it, that it might be an eternal hill instead of a man-made pile. Within the wall, seen on the right of the gate, there is a spacious room, the floor now grass-grown, from which a stone stair winds up the tower, climbing which we see below the garden of the present bishop, and in the distance, embowered in trees, is comfortable home, 
the present palace. Here's the list of uh, bishops there and deans. The cathedral stands in a sheltered valley on the west bank of the Taff, in a position which the founders undoubtedly chose for its beauty. And I would suggest it's sunken and out of view of passing uh, ships that might want to raid. While the cathedrals of the rest of the world are chiefly planted in the hearts of large towns, the founders of the Welsh cathedrals appear to have fled from the presence of man and to have fixed their dwellings in sight, sites suited rather for Cistercian abbeys than for cathedral churches. When Landaf was founded, probably the nearest dwelling place of man was two miles away through deep and broken forests. Cardiff Castle was not yet built, and the men who were to build it were unborn. Yet the natural beauty... Sorry. Uh, yet the natural beauty of the spot must have been great then as now. The taff is here broad and pebbly bottomed, and ripples gently under overhanging alders. With a smooth river on one side and the sheltering hill on the other, one feels again how well these old churchmen knew how to select the choicest spots of earth for their mortal abiding places. No words of mine can convey the dreamlike, bygone old world impression which is made by the slouching hill with its different levels of terraces, winding walks lined with old stone walls half hid in ivy which overlooks the west front of the cathedral. Our best view of the facade is from the Dean's Garden on the hill. Only from here can both the towers be seen to advantage, and even here the thick green of the trees growing below shuts off all the lower parts of the edifice. This facade much resembles that of Saint-Rémy in, in France, and is, no doubt, one of the most beautiful existing specimens of the transition between the latter Norman and early pointed styles. There are three stories, the lowest having a grand doorway, Norman as to its arch, but pointed in its other characteristics, among which is the carving of birds, apes, and human figures in the stone. Over this door is a sadly dilapidated statue of the good Saint Tylo. The second story presents three lofty lancet windows, and a third a central window flanked by three descending arches on each side, while a pedimental angle overhead is a niche in which stony stands Saint Duplicius, the first bishop. The Jasper Tudor Tower on the left greatly resembles that of St. John's Church, with its airy stone pinnacles and beautiful open-work parapet. The other tower is of modern construction, having been created within the last quarter of a century by an architect whose work is evidence of the erudition and good taste he brought to the task. The tower which formerly stood there was blown down in a storm previous to 1730, about which time the old cathedral was rescued from the lamentable state of decay into which it had fallen. The moment we crossed the threshold, we become aware of the peculiar perfume of which Hawthorne has somewhere spoken, and which belongs only to ancient piles like this. It is a musty smell, such as would gather in a disused trunk, which you should have for a year or two in your cellar, a clammy graveyard smell. Truth is, the dark corners in this old cathedral have not had a gl glimpse of sunshine. That's King Arthur, by the way. Since the grass was dug away, the stone floor laid and a roof put on it. A century and a half ago, the place is scrupulously clean, but it cannot be determined fresh. An old woman is sweeping the floor, who gives us but a passing look, a delightful feature of most of the ancient edifices in old, old South Wales, is that there are no droning guides to bother you and get in your way, and take all the savour out of your visit by preventing you from thinking. Having wandered at will through the nave, aisles, choir, lady chapel and charter house, chapter house, we amiably invite the old woman to talk to us which he does with a quaint reticence, which is simply admirable. A very quaint old woman indeed is this ancient dame, and worthy of a word in her own behalf. 
her withered face has a meek geniality of expression which warms our hearts towards her, and as she moves from tomb to tomb, speaking only in answer to our questions, with her hands folded decently on her apron, she is a picture befitting time, place, and mood. She points out the monument of St. Tylo, and laconically remarks that he was laid in 512. Stonely lies St. Tylo on the flat surface of the tomb, and remembering that of the old custom was for people to become before this tomb, and swear to their bargains. We join hands as we stand there, and ratify a certain bargain made in years gone by across the sea, which and which we mean shall be binding upon us to the grave. The quaint old woman locks, looks on with serene witness, but without comment, not being spoken to. St. Tyler was the hero, as the old chronicles tell us, of a feat known as the miraculous triplication of his mortal parts. This feat did Tylo perform after he was dead, and in this wise. In South Wales, there were three churches. Let's jump forward a bit there. In South Wales, there were three churches, many miles removed from each other, which laid claim to the saint's bones. One at Tembe, one at Llandilo, and the other here. And they agreed to settle their dispute by praying to Tylo himself. With a most accommodating spirit, the saint, instead of making trouble by showing partiality, decided to supply each with an undoubted and original. So when the kneeling clericals around St. Tylo's corpse are hours to their feet, lo, there were three corpses there, and each so exactly a counterpart of the other that there was nothing to choose between them. So each church bore off its precious burden in triumph. Clandeff, however, with an obstinacy as unfair as absurd, claimed for its own corpse a special holiness, especially to the disgust of its rivals. <laughs> Very impressive it is to walk about among these ponderous monuments, where saints and knights and ladies lie sleeping stonily on their backs, with clasped hands as they have slept for centuries past and will for centuries to come. They lay out in the storms of many a long year when the old church was roofless, and their stony faces are worn away as rocks are worn by the action of a waterfall. Lady Audley, who lies in a long robe in a niche, with two monks at her side, bearing escutcheons, we are gravely told, was one who fell a victim to disappointed love. Alas, nose and lips were eaten flat by the tooth of time, and the once rounded cheeks are rounded no more. Eyes, too, are shapeless. Hollows now, and amongst heads are mere formless balls of storm-worn marble. Christopher Matthew and his wife lie side by side. The holy Saint Tabricius and many other bishops keep the pair silent company. A knight of gigantic stature with a wonderful enormous face, which tells a prodigious tale of strength physical and spiritual, was Sir David Matthew. Standard bearer, says the Dane, to King Edward IV. From which we bestow on her a bit of silver, which sets her old face beaming again with virtuous satisfaction. Such shining largesse comes not often in her humble way, and we leave her alone with her sleepless effigies. <laughs> oh, look at that. So this, discovered by the Bishop of Land of April 1870, round about the time when this book was being written. So there we go. Hang on. So I hope you enjoyed that, and... Um, Find it interesting. There's lots more in here about various Welsh towns and things like that I'm going to be putting in. Plus, more stories coming up soon from some other books written in the 1880s and 1908. So look out for those. There's lots of other stuff going on, on the channel. Plus, a live broadcast every Sunday, 8 o'clock, which you're very welcome to join. 
So please hit the subscribe, notifications, and until the next time, peace, which will be saying in Wales, Heather.